So did you see the news? About. You didn't? About. There's been a lot of news. Um, Johnny Depp will direct his first directorial effort in 25 years. He's going to direct it in 25 years from no. now? His first directorial film. In, in 20, since, since, 25, 25 years. since 25 years ago. Titled Modi. It got you, didn't it? It's about like a Italian artist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it like the... and he's playing Modi. <laughs> Josh. <laughs> hey, welcome back to our stupid ranks with Corbin. I'm Johnny you Depp. Follow in- Instagram, Twitter for more juicy content. Thanks for follows. Check out the like button. So, like it, the 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 first line of the the headline got me. It said, "Johnny Depp will direct Modi, his first directorial <laughs> effort in 25 years." The biopic of Italian artist. Um, okay. I can't say that name. Uh, uh, uh Medio, Amedes, who will be led by Italian star. Got it. Uh, Riccardo Scarmaccio, Pierre Nini. And a lesser-known actor by the name of Al Pacino. They're good friends. I yeah. have been for a long time. But yeah, like, like I saw that, I was like, "He's doing what?" And was it spelled M O D I? Okay, in all caps. <laughs> Johnny Depp is Modi. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I got was like, "That's funny." What is happening? That's so funny. Uh, anyways, uh, that's not what this video is about. Not at all. But I just thought it was hilarious. I agree. Uh, today, uh, so this video is actually really interesting. It's called "Why Is Bollywood Obsessed with White Dancers?" Good question. <laughs> Good question. I would like to know. There seems to have been a a, a bucking of that trend yes. in recent years. Thank God. But for decades, there were too many white people. Maybe it's because the white man suppressed them and put them on the back burner for so long. Indians wanted to put white people on the back burner in the background. Maybe so. Maybe. Could be. Sit back there, colonizer. Exactly. Anyways, uh, so this video is going to go into a little depth of why that Where, is. Like you it. know what I was wondering during the coronation ceremony, which I didn't watch, I just saw pictures of it, and I saw the song that was being sung. Gross. You heard about what it sounds like they're singing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. About that, yeah. But... I was watching the pictures and the different videos that were on the news in different places, and all I could think to myself was, how many of those jewels came from India? Well, the one in the crown. I, I know. The one in the crown, for sure. I know. Here we go. Looked at the biggest hit dance numbers of Bollywood. Yes. What are random white dancers doing in the back? All, all the, the time. time. How did this even become a thing? It makes sense when you're doing a scene in New York or England. <laughs> Meguna, Meguna, you are my Sonia. That's Jeannie Rick hates that song. She now runs an animal center in Goa. But 20 odd years ago, oh, she that's great. a small entertainment and casting agency in London. And that's when she met Bollywood producer. So I was Nadia Wala. We did, he was he was really the first person that wanted to have Western women uh, in his movies, and it was for different reasons. For context, this is the same guy who has produced films like Firira Firi, Welcome, and Awara Bagal Diwana. Okay. He wanted women that would be willing to wear less clothes and kind of be the seductive ah, dress or interesting. be the bad woman that was ah, tainting someone like their husband, you know, that kind of thing. And Western that's culture trying to people had taint their, their culture. In those days. So, you know... In other words, the white women were willing to be more slutty. Something small around her that the Indian actresses didn't want to do. Sounds funny. I've never thought of that. The Western vamp in Bollywood is a running archetype that originated in the 1950s. The idea was simple. Indian women heroines had to uphold our great Indian sanskar. And so we mm. used loose Western women to play the evil seductress on screen. <laughs> but here's how that changed to featuring groups of Western dancers in songs. <laughs> So I did quite a few films with Feroz, but they were all quite small things. And then after I did the awards ceremony and we did Cabby Cushy, that's when things changed. Because Yash didn't want just particular looking girls. He wanted a whole mix. He wanted it to be like, because it was a university mm-hmm. thing. So he wanted people that were, you know, black, white, red haired, blonde, all different shapes and sizes. So that was quite refreshing. The Kabi Kushi Jeannie is referring to is Karan Johar's 2001 blockbuster film Kabi Kushi Kabi Gaon. It was set in India and the UK. 3K2! 
slate of big budget K3G. Bollywood films no. that are focusing on stories of NRIs. With Kabhi Kushi Kabhi Gum, Karan and Yash Johar went out of their way There's to three have Ks. the scale and glamour quotient of the NRI film. Lecha, lecha. One of the greatest soundtracks in all of Bollywood. He said, look, if I'm shooting this, if I'm making this movie that is supposedly based out of London College, then I can't have Indian dancers there. So hence he then got these dancers. Right, there's many times that happens. It's that in London or New York. That makes more sense. That's yeah. Now a leading wedding planner and previously an ad executive for over a decade, <laughs> who has been working with white performers since the trend began. And I think from there onwards, it created the trend of getting in international dancers to make the backdrop look beautiful, to make the pick the song look really sexy, to make the whole environment look a notch higher. Yeah. I mean, Gora skin always works in these kind of surroundings, yeah, so unfortunately, that's how it is. Aditya bluntly states the philosophy of much of the ad and entertainment world back then. And even today, though conversations about representation, beauty norms, and colorism have become more mainstream, our old ideas of Gora skin being equal to glam remain strong. I think originally, when we first got the request to come through in the late 1990s, early 2000s, Western artists were exotic, and um, for for a national. Um, audience in India, they probably hadn't been exposed mm. to Western types of dancing. They were fresh talents to expose to an audience of millions and millions in India. For the NRIs or the Indian diaspora living in other areas of the world, it was probably enjoyable for them to see other countries reflected in these films to feel that they can still stay connected to India, no matter that these people are going out to Switzerland, <laughs> UK, America, yeah. Spain, you know, all these all these wonderful countries. Upon release, when K3G became one of the biggest domestic hits in India and number three at the global box office in the UK, oh, success and great that featuring white dancers would become a staple not just in big budget Bollywood songs yeah. but also beyond. After K3G, it became like a big trend, and I. I I still use, uh, you know, the foreign dancers and our Indian dancers fused together. It looked really beautiful. Uh, there was Mala Lagla, there was Johnny Gaddar also, like, you know, where I wanted to infuse our dancers. You know, ads have shot a lot with uh, a lot of international dancers, the British dancers, where uh, there was a tea bag ad, I remember, there was a DO ad. I'll give you a tea bag. But what really motivated British dancers to travel across the world to perform in India? Hi, my name is Gunther Smith. Yeah, my role in, I did two films in Bollywood, which one was Kabakushi Kabikan, and the other one was Kalwana Ho. Disco! It's the time to disco! The pay wasn't anywhere to what we would have got paid in England. No. But it's all about the experience. Um, you get to see a different country, and, uh, and you get to travel, and sometimes you take you, you take less payment to experience that. It was yeah, it, you know, I like I was I'm smiling just thinking about it. In fact, most dancers didn't seem to know much about Bollywood before they came here. Or or I knew that it was very um, extravagant compared to, to kind of like like here in the UK. Lots of colours, lots of dancers, everyone very happy, everyone, you know, with their more, you know, the moves, everything, all, all in unison. For most young British dancers like Gunther and Clinton, it was about the experience of coming to India, getting to be in a Bollywood film, sometimes clubbing the shoot with a trip to the Taj Mahal. <laughs> they made the most of being here and had a blast on shoot. That's but for great. others, especially women, it could seem like a big career move. As I was at university studying performing arts, I was I was studying dance, drama, and music and um, started doing castings and auditions. And um, this casting came up for a part in a Bollywood movie. And I just thought, this is it, this is my chance um, to get out to India. That's Anna Edwards, a British model, performer, and actress who auditioned for her first Bollywood movie role about 20 years ago. She wasn't sure whether she was cast as a dancer or an actor back then. And her experiences highlight the absurdity like a Bond girl. of this industry trend. The director comes up and tells me that I'm shooting with this snake and I was like, okay. And then this basket gets carried over to where I where I am on set. And I was hardly wearing anything. I was kind of wearing like a bikini sort of thing because they were going to wrap me in um, purple and red silks. And um, 
And then on comes this guy with his snake <laughs> in this basket. And he takes the lid off the basket and it was a six. I was going to say, it looks like a python. python. You know, the body of it was The massive. head looks like a python. And now I am going, like, is this for real? They genuinely wanted me to lie on the floor. <laughs> and then they That's came usually, out and draped It's usually and said in the casting still. notes. <laughs> and I still didn't actually understand what what the scene was. And I can remember just looking at the director and saying, oh my God, can I just have a minute to get used to what's going on here? And he was like, we don't have a minute, Anna. <laughs> get on with it. And it didn't just end there. <laughs> the stereotypes about Western women that Bollywood had been perpetuating over the decades translated into Western women's treatment of screen tone. <laughs> we just watched We just yes, reacted to this. <laughs> and commented on all the white women. Because at the time, it wasn't very common um, for Western girls to go and work in India. I found that there was a false perception oh, yeah. of Western girls. From seeing what we saw, I, the, the Western people, I would say was, we'd have Western dancers and, and you would have them clothed in, a, in the smaller things. So the girls would be, you know, they'd be in like the Kabigushi, they were, you know, little bra top and, and the short skirts and things like that. But, um, the Hindi dancers or so forth, you, you didn't you didn't have that. So there was that element to it where Western dancers, it was like, we're allowed to put them in this, but you know, it, they weren't allowed to be put in this. And I, you know, I, I kind of got that because you know, religions and, and, and that kind of thing, but um, why is it acceptable to put that onto another nation, onto somebody that's not from one, you know? Yes, we had to put up with some challenging behavior from male-dominated industry, but we broke the ice, and that's how I see it. K3G clearly made it cool to feature Western dancers in films, but there were other factors that pushed the trend to feature white dancers in particular forward. Non-stop, they were using the foreign dancers, and that time, she started with London British dancers. Then other countries came in, Australian dancers, especially Russia, Ukrainian, everything mixed and matched. And there were other things started opening. They started using them commercially for their corporate, for birthday parties and everything. So it became weird. Suddenly, the market has become the people started taking, they started opening the business that way. Once this trend began to pick up, producers and agencies started realizing that hiring from Eastern European countries with weaker currencies made more sense, since they could be paid lower wages and were more willing to relocate to and work out of India. I just think the kind of people that started to be booked, they were, you know, they weren't trained dancers, they weren't, didn't have any skill sets, they were quite happy to work longer hours for less money, so it made it more difficult for us and the dancers it's not such a novelty for them to come over anymore they've been before you know they know the money's not good and the hours are long they've already kind of ticked it off their list so it became harder and harder to find people that wanted to come mm. the Yash Raj film Joom Barabar Joom was Janie's last gig after which the changing economics of the business made her leave this industry and show business far behind. But the trend still lives on. Even as Bollywood itself changes form with the rise of the pan-India blockbuster, Masala film songs around the country continue to feature white background dancers. <laughs> this was supposed to be in London, this nightclub scene, but we shot it here. <laughs> Oh my god. It's I haven't seen this for ages. I'm gonna have this in my head the whole day now. <laughs> and this got used, this song got used over and over again for other things as well. Mehuna, Mehuna, you are my Sonia. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, is it did. the the wanting scandalous dancing and scandalous that makes sense. Women to wear scandalous clothing, but not want to taint the Indian culture yeah. with having Indian women in it. it, it may, uh, uh, makes absolute sense in that uh, regard. In that regard. The other thing that they didn't cover that. I'm guessing it was intentional. I don't know. Uh, when was this video made? Uh, two months ago. Okay, yeah. Really I, recent. I, without question, and we know this by reason of those we've talked to over the years, videos we've seen about this particular topic, specifically about agencies and the film industry, 
a huge reason that they didn't talk about, and I don't know where it would stand as far as the larger reason, but it's a big one, was they have white skin. Yeah. There's a, there's a reason that there has been the predominance of lightning creams and the ill treatment of particularly women who have dark skin. And using white girls propagates and perpetuates this fake ideal that you're more beautiful the whiter you are. Yeah. I wish they had talked about that because not talking about that seems particularly disingenuine. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. Well-made video, though, by the way. Very uh, well for, done. For the, I just wish they'd covered yeah. that reality because it is very much a dark underbelly. And if you're going to tell why Bollywood is obsessed with white dancers, you got to be honest about the good reasons as well as the really bad reasons. And they left out the bad reasons. Yeah. Um, and the channel is the, the the Swaddle. The Swaddle, I believe. The, the swaddle. swaddle. Did they create the video or just publish the video? I believe it's their video. Their video? I mean, it, yeah. Really cool to see some of the dancers that were involved then and to hear some of the input and all of that makes so much sense. Yeah. They probably hire actor, white actors the exact same way. <laughs> which is why. It, yeah, we know that. Is, which is why they're terrible, usually. Yep. Exactly. Outside of the goat, the great white goat, Mark Bennington. It's true. Actually, and But the reason that the goat is working so consistently mm -hmm. is because Mark lives in India. So this, uh, There's, it's much, much easier to have him work because you don't have to fly him in from the United States or from London. And he's already living within a context where he understands the, the pay rate. What's this? Uh, we need to portray a white man. Bali <laughs> It's, it says we need to betray a white man, and every frame is Mark Bennington. <laughs> hey, if he's a great guy, and he has a great book, by the way. If you don't know that, look it up. Mark has a really great book. If you only have one good white actor, why not use him over? <laughs> yeah, he's he has said because I've talked to him about many things, and one of those things is is you know many different times talked with Indrani about what would life look like if if we lived in India mm -hmm. and or at least had a home there and a home here. And Mark's reply to me was, you'd work all the time, bud. Yeah. Uh, the, the, there's a, as we know, yeah. a huge lack of talented actors. And and the big reason for that is how much it freaking costs. to Even when you do something, which you have to do for most projects in India, when you have to do something for SAG actors like we are, and you, you do it under what's called the one rule, which is it, it, it's an allowance for a film that's out of SAG jurisdiction to use a SAG actor. It's used frequently for international films. However, there's still going to come an expectation for the compensation to be commiserate to what you would make at basic scale, which is going to be way beyond what Whoa. you'd pay an actor to do that role if you hired them in India. Well, that's why you basically, if you and plus live, flying and accommodations, basically, basically why if, if you live there, you basically will give up your SAG. Oh, well, that's what Mark did. Yeah, because Mark, Mark was Mark's not SAG anymore. No, he was. Um, SAG. But I mean, he makes a good living over there. He Absolutely, he does. He's working all so. the time. He teaches. He teaches acting classes. Yeah, good for him, man. Yeah. Uh, anyways, a good video. Uh, let us know what you thought about the video and any other videos we can react to down below. Just